a very good morning to everyone uh, joining us for the 12th session of this value chain exploration uh, program that we have, looking at different value chains and the problems and the constraints that we have, given that we are still in alert level three uh, due to the pandemic and how we address problems. So the next two sessions are gonna focus uh, specifically on those two value chains where prohibitions of sales are causing major problems. And the first one we're going to address is the cigarettes or the tobacco trade, and specifically looking and delving into the value chains and the impacts uh, that the prohibition trade of cigarettes is having. And also the other unintended consequences like illicit trade, et cetera, and what the industry is doing on this. But to first introduce the subject, we're going to play you a short video uh, just to give you an in indication. British American Tobacco South Africa has lost more than 2 billion rand in revenue since the nine-week lockdown began. Alcohol um, can be sold for off-site consumption, but tobacco products sales, they remain prohibited. These regulations have hit tobacco producers the hardest as government continues to block sale of their products, citing health reasons. More than 2,000 people opposed it. And of course, the government then took that into consideration, debated the matter, looked at it, and decided that we must continue as we are when it comes to cigarettes, tobacco products, and related. That we should. Take us like gangsta because we deal with big gangsta to get cigarettes. These people are quite scary. Yes, they are very scary. They carry guns around. You can't trust anyone. I feel ashamed because it's not okay. Now they have a proper job. Exactly. We say lift the ban. Livelihoods are at stake. It's not just a job. It's my life, my family's life, my child's education. Thousands of jobs already lost. Help save our jobs. Hi, my name is Mohau. I'm one of the employees working in the tobacco manufacturing company. I have been in this company for almost two decades. That is why I've been able to make my livelihoods for all this time. Well, things have been challenging because the economy has not been doing good and so on and so forth. However, since the introduction of lockdown on the 26th of March 2020, things have been extremely worse for our industry. We know that the government in their attempt to control the spread of COVID went to as far as to regulate the industry by making sure that they ban the sale of tobacco. What is frustrating currently is that tobacco is available in every corner of the township. People are selling tobacco every day, people are smoking tobacco every day, which makes it difficult for us as a legitimately operating entity to be able to make an honest livelihood, to be able to pay our dues even to the government. We as workers, are suffering in the very same vein. Our livelihoods have been threatened. There is no company that can carry you for more than three months when you are not making any income for the business. We are struggling. Our jobs are threatened. We are appealing to the government to seriously review this harsh regulation on the tobacco industry and unban the sale of tobacco for the sake of all our goodness. We know that the government has been overemphasizing the element of balancing livelihoods and the lives of people. Let that balance be stricken even in the tobacco industry. We have to be allowed to sell at one point. People have to be allowed to exercise their right and freedom to choose and do what they enjoy, which is smoking. Thank you. My name is Edna Klobosh and together with my husband Joe Klobosh we've been farming tobacco for the past 26 years in the Pope. The impact on the, on the farm level of the ban that's being created on tobacco sales had an enormous devastating result in the 160 full-time farm laborers that we have on the farm. Out of that 160, they all have about a family of about four dependents that rely on them for their source of income. That gives us an amount of around about 600 people that rely on legal tobacco being sold in South Africa 
from just one farm in the Limpopo province. I read an article in News24 a while ago where Mr. Ramaphosa said that the ban will be lifted one day. My message to him and the council is that we cannot wait for one day to eat again, to pay our school fees again, to pay the hospital or the doctor's bill again. These people need the ban to be lifted today and no later than today. We plead to you, please lift the ban on the tobacco in order for the livelihoods of hardworking, legal people wanting to make a living in South Africa. I'm joined by a very esteemed panel today to deliberate on this matter uh, further. I'm firstly going to introduce you to Johnny Moloto. Johnny is the Head of External Affairs at British American Tobacco South Africa. Welcome, Johnny. Then Thank we you. Have, then we have uh, Sinen Mguni. Sinen is the Chairman of, of um, FITA, that's the Fair Trade Independent Tobacco Association. And uh, Sinen will also engage with you on the court cases and the status thereof, and so uh, where you see it's going. Then um, thirdly, we have Shadrach Sabisi. Shadrach is the Chairman of the Black Tobacco Farmers Association, BFTA, but he's also, if I'm correct, the Chairman of the South African Tobacco Transformation Alliance, SATA. Uh, let me start with you, uh, Shadrach. Perhaps you can introduce the, the aspects of the Tobacco Alliance, Transformation Tobacco Alliance of South Africa, uh, how that came about and how you your engagements with government to get the ban lifted. Thank you so much, John, for having me, and thank you, all colleagues. Uh, it has been a very cumbersome uh, journey to reach uh, to the formation of uh, South African Tobacco Alliance. Firstly, I need to make mention of the point that the uh, BTFA, Black Tobacco Farmers Association, have been a brainchild of all this uh, new era of black tobacco farmers in the five provinces where the leaf is being produced. And looking at the situation as it was by then, remember, we started uh, the tobacco farming in 2010, in here in Pumalanga. But uh, along the road, we realized that uh, something was finished and you didn't know what that happened. Then we uh, started questioning the service provider that uh, helped us to start uh, the project with trying to find out how we need to get funding from one hectare to two hectares. But that never happened. What was the problem? up until uh, in uh, 2016, where by I came to meet uh, the other guys from the other provinces uh, to check if are they funding or are they standing the same state. And uh, they said, hey, Shadrach, we don't know what the problem was. Then I came up with an idea telling them, look here, guys, if we will continue this way, we are not going to go anywhere because we don't really understand what's the problem because we should be expanding, but that is not happening. Then we come to question now uh, mobile skill development and training. So they refer us to LTP, the Popo Tobacco Processor. Then LTP said, Jack, we have been struggling since 2009. Because the market shares are going down every year, in year out. Then I asked them what was the reason behind that, and then they say there's this uh, monster called illicit uh, in the cigarette industry. Then I asked them why, why, why can you deal with uh, the illicit? Because we have got all the relevant stakeholders in the country. We've got SARS, we've got the SP, APS, we've got everyone that can deal with such a thing. 
Then they said they've been trying, but uh, do not. Well, then we said no, because uh, we have tapped into the inner, so we need to get organized. Then that's where PTFA was born. Then from there, we still have a platform now to engage uh, with the government. But still, things were not coming together. Then we realized that let's try to create another platform now. Maybe they think we are too disorganized as an industry that you, the government will have uh, an ear to listen to us. Then we approach uh, LTP to say, look, guys, let's now think uh, together now, put our hands together and form something that is going to encompass all the different stakeholders in the industry. After LTP, then we said, no, we need also to look at the, our main buyer. Then we came up and said, no, we will have to approach a British, American, South Africa. Uh, then, The Black Tobacco Farmers Association uh, established now the South African Tobacco Transformation Alliance. The three members from Black Tobacco Farmers Association established that. I was the chair from Pumalanga and uh, Jablani Tembe from KZN as well as um, Erasmus Ekwaloshe from Lipopo. Then we now started to engage the Taral with the other uh, partners that they need to now buy into the idea and take membership. That's how the South African Tobacco Transformation came into being. There's been a long journey in the cumbersome one for that matter. But we hope one day the government, especially, will have an ear to listen. Because, uh, surely speaking, for me and the members uh, that uh, formed the BTFA, I had to quit working in 2007, looking at myself. Will I be continue working and making a difference uh, to the economy of the country, uh, to the welfare of my sibling or the community at large, so to speak, then I said, oh, no, I must do something. Uh, and so I'm going to go to to, to uh, Sinin. Sinin, um, we've seen that, that, um, that this ban on the tobacco uh, trade has, has, has really affected the industry very negatively, and that it has spawned uh, an illegal or illicit trade, which is which already was active before the lockdown, and has just basically given it free reign uh, across the country. Uh, please give us a background to your the court action that you have taken, and the status thereof, and perhaps the grounds on which you are challenging the, the ban on uh, cigarette trade. Uh, by government. Yes, uh, when the when the ban uh, on the sale of cigarettes, well, actually initially there wasn't a clear clear sort of understanding as to whether the regulations included uh, a ban on the sale of cigarettes. We were merely told that essential goods would be sold, and I think everyone on this panel recalls what happened in the first few weeks, where the, there were certain provinces that stated that. Um, Cigarettes would be sold in those provinces because, according to their interpretation of the regulations, as they stood then, um, cigarettes could be sold and it didn't uh, prohibit the sale of cigarettes. So, we then embarked on the journey of CETA, and I think um, the, the organizations like Johnny and uh, Shadra represent also did the same thing of engaging government. We, we sought to, to um, firstly, you know, get clarity as to whether the regulations did not permit. Um, instead of cigarettes, what then happened was a, a sort of what I can best describe as, as industry being strung along. I mean, you would hear the president saying he would apply his mind to this issue for weeks. This went on 
person who was the president during the time of the Premier Alan Rinke of the Western Cape government to discuss this very issue. And then after the government stated that they would discuss this issue before the end to proceed. And I think us as an organization at the time were very hopeful that you know, sanity would prevail and that there would be no need to go to court. So, I mean, in the initial lockdown period, there was no intention from our side of going to court. What then transpired is that it became abundantly clear that government had no intention of lifting the cigarette ban. That was in and around the 17th of April. Uh, there was an announcement by government on that. It was a Friday, if I recall correctly, when they stated that um, they would not be lifting the bans on the sale of alcohol and, and cigarettes and other tobacco products. And we thought that it, it became now imperative for us as an organization whose members are cigarette manufacturers primarily to, to you know, um, see if we cannot seek people from the courts. And we, in fact, wrote a letter of demand to government on the 20th of April, uh, to which uh, government stated that uh, it would be premature for us to go to court because the president is due to, uh, to address the nation on the 23rd of April, and uh, they would like us to, to hold any court proceedings in advance, uh, pending the announce any announcements to be made by the president. The president then makes an announcement. He says the sale of cigarettes will be permitted from the 1st of May, and equivocally so. So we then abandon our court application, thinking everything is hunky-dory. Fast forward a week later, we are then addressed by a different uh, government official, the Minister of uh, Cooperative Governments and Traditional Affairs, being uh, Dr. Gonzalo Caminis. Now, we got a very uneasy sort of uh, feeling during that week because there seemed to be rumors in, in newspapers that, uh, that that minister was not happy with the president's announcement. And uh, I mean, there were all sorts of uh, rumors of political power plays that the decision by the president would be reversed. And obviously, I mean, I had discussed it with a number of industry role players and Everyone sort of thought that there is no way the president would allow such a thing to happen, and we thought that it's one of those things that we don't anticipate happening. And then the rest they say is history. Um, the the ban was lifted. So that Monday that followed the announcement by the minister of uh, cooperative government, we launched our court application, and we served on government. And um, that then uh, it was a two pronged uh, process where in part A was pretty straightforward. I mean, we also had to charge them because government was being very difficult on the issue of uh, confirming, uh, as per the regulations, that we could manufacture for export purposes, amongst other things, and um, that they would then provide us with a record of decision in relation to their plan, um, which, which they all conceded, and we then proceeded to Part B, which was heard on the 10th. And that went to them, that regard was, um, was against us. Now, in as far as uh, the grounds that we relied upon in our court application, the first ground, which is our main ground of uh, legal ground of uh, contesting these regulations, is that uh, Regulations 27 of the Level 4 regulations and Regulation 45 of the Level 3 regulations are ultra periods of Section 27 of the Disaster Management Act. And now that is to say that Disaster Management Act does not permit uh, or empower government to make such a regulation. and. This, this particular argument, um, perhaps uh, the court said, turns on interpretation of the act because the act um, says that uh, anything that is, any regulations that are promulgated must be necessary. Now, there's only one constitutional court case which dealt with the definition of the word necessary, uh, the federal case. And that case states that it must be strictly necessary. But the court in our minds have deviated from that and said that, no, but that dealt with the local. Um, state of emergency, uh, state of disaster, and it cannot be applied to a national state of disaster where the challenges are completely different. So in essence, they, they made new case law in that regard. And then they said that the test for uh, making it strictly necessary for the minister to, uh, when, when they, uh, what's it, implementing uh, regulations would make it too onerous and too high of a threshold, particularly when the minister is talking certain life, which is something we didn't agree with. Uh, because, I mean, we led uh, all sorts of medical evidence to show that the minister here yeah, had not, um, did not have uh, a concordant unanimous support in as far as medical evidence, which he couldn't um, say that this was necessary. 
Um, and then we we heard we dealt with the, the rationale, the rationality of the, the ban. And we 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 say for a number of reasons. I mean, there are many that we can raise. The, the predominant one again being the medical evidence, which is inconclusive. And and um, when you look at empirical data, many would say that it would favor our case because I mean, there's always been in, in every country study a very very low percentage of smokers who seem to have been affected severely by the virus. When you look at people. Who, Business from comorbidities like diabetes, where in South Africa at a stage, 52% of people who had got their lives to the virus were, were diabetic. And yet, you did not see a ban on the sale of sugar, of sugar and, and other um, products which are deleterious to one's health, um, you know, such as fizzy drinks. And, and we raised that, but the court didn't seem to apply its mind to that. You know, we raised the argument of the international standard in that. Currently, South Africa is the only country in the world that seems to have banned the sale of cigarettes and other tobacco products. And in fact, when we were in court, it was a South African Botswana. Botswana since then has, uh, on the 24th of June, a couple of days prior to judgment uh, being handed down, they lifted their ban. So currently, we are the lone ranger. And again, it, it, it just doesn't accord with you know, international standards. And if you look at it, we, we are high up in terms of infections. We ban tobacco. When you look at a, chi- a country like China, another country is Taiwan, uh, South Korea, and so forth that have a high percentage of adult smokers. They didn't ban smoking, but they were able to contain the spread of the virus. You know? So you know, we, we we couldn't understand that. Then obviously the elephant in the room, the the illicit trade, in that you elicit forfeiting billions of rands, which you could be using to combat the uh, the, the virus and its spread. Uh, and you, you're enriching criminal syndicates in essence. Um, that also has a pro- an issue that, I mean, we were, we were even prior to lockdown quite concerned, and we had raised this issue with SARS, and that we're seeing a lot of um, products coming in from our neighboring countries now more than ever. I mean, um, and uh, our concern is that, uh, you know, they, now more than ever, South Africans are becoming more accustomed to these brands, and, you know, uh, long term, even post the ban, you, you will see a situation where the, the market of the legitimate industry is eroded, and, and that can only be to the detriment of not only the, the, the industry, but also the systems. Uh, and this is something that we raised, and the government didn't seem to, to I mean, sorry, the courts didn't seem to um, pay too much attention to this. And then we raised the issue, I mean, this for me is, is perhaps the most, um, confusing element of this whole thing in that the, the president makes an announcement that they are lifting the ban on the sale of cigarettes. The minister then re- relies not on medical evidence at this juncture, she relies on the fact that some 2,000 people objected to, to the lifting of the ban on the sale of cigarettes. Now, when you look at that number alone, even if we have to accept, if we have to accept that the 2,000 were, were people objecting, I mean, when you compare it to the amount of people that have been further bad. I mean, that's in the millions. Um, but be that as it may, we then uncovered when the document was discovered to us that the actual number was more than the 400s. There were a lot of, um, I think government did not actually take the time to to go through. Uh, John, I don't know if you can hear me. Okay, but yeah, yeah. Uh, they didn't take yeah. to actually go through these documents because a lot of them were duplicates. And some of them did not even have anything to do with um, tobacco. And, um, you know, when when we we thought that raising this to a court would show that, I mean, there doesn't seem to be bona fides from the government side. I mean, you, you didn't um, re, re-implement the ban based on medical evidence. It was based on the submission. But when the submissions are scrutinized, it's almost 50, 50, for and against. And it's not the number that you stated. Uh, and yet the courts didn't seem to take this into consideration. And I mean, it still has yet to be explained in a forum as to why the president made that announcement. And I mean, surely that announcement would have been based on medical evidence of some sort. I don't think the president uh, went there on his own frolic and decided to just speak his mind. Um, I'm of the view that it was based on advice from um, the Ministerial Advisory Committee, which again, we, we stated in our papers, they've come out on record to say they did not support the ban on the of cigarettes and tobacco products. Neither did um, the Minister of Finance and neither did um, the Commissioner of South. 
So again, it just it's illogical. We the only country that has this ban in place. The courts seem to be reluctant to intervene. I mean, the the judgment in essence makes it almost impossible for anyone to challenge these lockdown regulations because they they in essence state that um, the minister has taken the best decision in as far as what she felt was necessary to save lives. And uh, if she relied on medical evidence, the weight thereof is is uh, irrelevant. And the fact that you rely on some medical evidence is, is sufficient. So, uh, in, in as far as our court application, we, we're going along. I know I've had discussions with industry role players about this matter, and we were always of the view that this is the kind of matter that will go all the way to the apex court. So, I mean, we aren't discouraged in the least in as far as the, the rulings of, of, uh, of the full bench of the Victoria High Court. I mean, we, we're very confident that the Supreme Court of Appeal will come to a different conclusion. And uh, we are pressing ahead as, as being reported in the media. Thank, thank you. I'm going, to, I'm going to come back to you the, uh, uh, on the illicit trade because I want to ask to explore that because you, you stand for fair trade and that means legal trade. And uh, we, we, we want to explore the illicit trade a little bit as well. And we've noted that you have uh, brought an appeal action against the judgment. Uh, and then we'll uh, obviously see how that uh, pans out. Johnny, I want to come to you now from uh, British American Tobacco. And uh, mm -hmm. the top end of the value chain. Um, uh, so you see what's happening up and down the value chain. Uh, give us a perspective of the damage, the economic damage that we that we're experiencing in our value chain, also to government in terms of uh, excise duties, etc. Thanks, for that. Um so, John, I think our our journey with this one has been quite a lengthy one as well, right from uh, the eve uh, of the lockdown. Uh, so on the 26th of March, we we're watching with very keen interest when uh, Minister Patel was announcing, you know, what was going to happen with effect from midnight with a lockdown. And uh, there were a couple of other ministers with them and they announced that, you know, uh, these are the measures that are going to be put in place and what would co constitute essential goods. And immediately, you know, uh, for us, alarm bells started to ring. And at that point, there was no reference at all to tobacco pro and related products. It was just we knew, having read the Disaster Management Act, that in all likelihood, alcohol would definitely be in scope. So with, with, with no further clarity on what was going to happen to tobacco, uh, fortunately, there was a sharp journalist in the audience who picked that up and asked the question. And the minister just gave a flippant response to say that, you know what, uh, our tobacco uh, is not, uh, cigarettes are not essential goods. So immediately we started firing off letters, you know, and we fired off letters to all the ministers in the economic cluster. You know, uh, we also did write to the Minister of Health, but Patel in particular, finance uh, uh, was also quite important for us. So it's all those people that we made sure that uh, uh, we started as early as then to raise these concerns. Three concerns that we raised. One was around uh, 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 that uh, the intention behind the restriction of, um, uh, or rather, to prevent the, the the virus from further spreading, was to restrict movement of people so that you can easily protect and control uh, uh, people from the spread of the virus. We said that's okay. First argument. We, we, we responded to that. We said our concern to that is that if you don't come up with an unequivocal statement on restricting the movement of people through the sale of all goods that people would normally buy on a regular basis, you are going to actually not achieve your objective because people will move from one retail outlet to the other trying to find tobacco products. So we raised the alarm bells earlier on and we said, secondly, and this new trade that was already booming already uh, even before lockdown will now like have a field day. I don't know what was going to make it different under the lockdown for government to be able to effectively and easily uh, control uh, the spread or, uh, or rather the, 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 the booming illicit trade. The other concern we raised earlier on was around how a value chain for, uh, uh, works because it was quite clear to us at that very stage that the government had not taken into consideration that value chains are very complex uh, systems. They don't work according you chopping and slicing and dicing one aspect of the value chain and say, okay, we'll allow farming, but we won't allow this. We'll allow that, but we won't allow that. 
And we even said, even at the retail outlet level, right now there was stock already on the road moving towards the channel. How do you actually even manage that? Because already uh, suppliers are sitting with stocks on credit. So if they are not going to move that stock, uh, you are also impacting their payment terms. So, and no single response was received from them, which I thought, you know, was in really bad taste and bad form that, you know, if you say uh, later, which was going to be the minister's uh, favorite refer uh, refrain that this is a government that listens, but over 30 letters and submissions just from us, our value chain alone, not a single response to that. And uh, what we had already questioned about at the beginning came to prove uh, uh, to be quite true. What that forced us, what that forced us to do uh, immediately and earlier on was to actually put a factual case to government of saying, maybe you don't quite understand how the tobacco value chain, because we knew that there was a lot of assumptions and uh, uh, problems around it. We also didn't just complain, but we also started advancing proposals. We said, guys, here's the size of the uh, uh, legal tobacco value chain based on receipts, on your excise receipts, based on VAT declared, based on corporate tax paid, and based on actual, you know, uh, sales uh, into, into the channel. And this is what the value chain looks like. Having said that, we said, um, we understand what the health concerns are that were later raised around the sharing of cigarettes. And, the, and even earlier then, we raised the concern to say that a ban therefore will not address that. If anything, the ban will speed up that. Therefore, what we suggest, in the same way you are teaching South Africans just across the, uh, the board uh, about the strict adherence to health protocols, you know, regular washing of your hands, don't touch your eyes, uh, 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 nose and mouth, all those kind of things should equally be allowed to actually be, 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 be done uh, for, for smokers. And we said, in that case, uh, realizing government's uh, uh, overstretched resources, this would be our contribution throughout the value chain. We do that right from the farm level right uh, into, into, into the retail channel so that we're able to at least still preserve what existed of the legal tobacco value chain and make sure that uh, we also play our part in the prevention of the spread of the virus. We also said what you are able to do, a lot of the guys, with the exception probably of uh, 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 the processing as well as the, the manufacturing level, a lot of the guys further downstream, uh, as well as right at the beginning of the value chain, are mostly hand to mouth, you know, in terms of their economy. So if you remove just even a month's uh, uh, economic activity, those jobs are gone forever. Either the leaf is going to get damaged because it's being stored, uh, it's not being processed as it's supposed to be within certain timelines. There's a problem there. And not only that, we as well as manufacturers, we're not buying any leaf we're not going to be using. And further downstream, if you look at tabletops, for example, the guys who sell sweets and uh, cigar cigarette sticks, those guys, that's what drives uh, their revenue for them. Even spaza shops, in spaza shops, in uh, even supermarkets, your footfall is driven by mainly those goods where people come regularly for return buys. So if you remove that, it's an entire livelihood gone. But not only that, there are certain uh, wholesalers, uh, there are certain uh, uh, tobacconists. Their sole business model is just selling tobacco products. If you shut that down, the guys cannot sustain themselves be beyond a, a, a month. And remember, they also have running costs that are not going away. You know, your rental costs, your staff, uh, uh, your salaries and so on. You still need to make those payments. How do you then manage that without going bust? And the reality is that if you entirely build your your business around it, it's quite in, impossible that having learned from this bad experience of the lockdown or the ban, for you to actually try to resuscitate that business. In all likelihood, you are folding and you're not coming back to that space. And this is exactly what we are seeing, that uh, we are prepared to actually, you know, uh, throw out the bail with, with the bathwater without having us meet somehow halfway. But what also has been very disturbing and concerning is that uh, uh, our, our friends in alcohol managed largely to win their arguments on the basis of the value chain argument and also the farmers that are dependent on the sector. Mm -hmm. we, the, we are not different from this, which is even ironic that alcohol is expressly uh, provided for in the disaster management. Uh, with us, no matter how cogent the arguments we made, uh, 
to say they fell on deaf, that their fears is an exaggeration because they were not even listened to. They were not even entertained any of that. You know, what was even more interesting is that every attempt to engage any government minister was met with a, you know, stern rebuff to say that, you know what, guys, you go talk to that minister. Uh, you know, just being shunted pillar to post without being offered a hearing to say that, you know, uh, even if we don't agree with you, let, let's at least hear you out, you know, and hear what your views are, what your uh, suggestions are. So we have been working very closely, uh, needless to say, uh, our farmers who sell to us uh, are very anxious, you know, on a regular basis, uh, because right now, you know, we're going into the next planting cycle. And there's a lot of anxiety in the value chain. A lot of investors uh, or other farmers are asking themselves, should we prepare the soil? Uh, to plant uh, when we don't know if we'll have a market, when we don't know when is the ban being lifted. And remember, as business, we generally rely on predictability of rules and regulations. So already, if we're going to plan for next year, we need to know how next year is going to look like. And from what we are seeing now, we were sitting now, next year looks very bleak. So that is a good, huge source of concern for us. So. That is why now uh, uh, we are starting to support all these campaigns that we've been pushing and saying that, you know what, uh, we will play our part to defend the jobs that we provide, to defend our consumers, by the way, uh, because now suddenly law-abiding citizens have been turned into criminals without due regard uh, to actually making sure that they have the necessary support mechanisms. If you wanted to push people to quit by force, you should at least have had some support mechanisms in place like counseling and so on. You don't just uh, remove somebody from a, a, an addictive product without the necessary support. So this, these, are the, these are all the unintended consequences and the, there's only one beneficiary out of this. It's the illicit players. Oops. The state is losing 35 million rand a day in excise taxes. They are making in excess of 100 million rand a day. What we are seeing being captured is nothing. Those busts are nothing. Uh, when Minister Mowini says, what's the number, 77 million thus far, that's a joke. That number is far more higher than that. What, it, what, what he's accounting for is only what they've captured. He's not accounting for what they've not captured. Now you tell me guys, do you think that post the lifting of the ban, uh, these guys are going to give up that uh, lucrative uh, 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 pipeline? Never. They've uh, firmly entrenched that pipeline. They are actually going to make sure they hang on to all those customers because it's easy picking them. Not only that, you've already got an indication from the state that, that, that the government doesn't care. The government doesn't care. They can do whatever it takes to bring down the industry. Uh, and if that it, it takes, that's what it takes to hand it over to illicit players. So let it be. Thank you. And uh, for that extensive coverage, and, and, and you make so many good points. Uh, the one that really does concern me the most is, is, is government's intransigence to, to engage with their, with their industry, to, to talk out and to talk through the problems and the, and the, and the, the constraints, the challenges that, that, that we have. Uh, yeah. it, it, it actually shows a lack of argument if you don't want to engage. And yeah. I think we got to keep pushing uh, them, and then also, obviously, I, I, I have a huge issue on civil liberties. I, I feel I feel strong infringement on our civil liberties, which is uh, brings in a draconian type of government, which I think we should we should all be worried about. But uh, back to the illicit trade a little bit later, because I think this is really, really becoming going to become a big issue. And how do we open? Uh, I want to get back to Shadrach. Shadrach, I hope you can hear me. Just now, we missed quite a bit of your part of your um, intro introduction, and I, I want you just to to, to again re reiterate the main points of the second half of what you were saying just now. And then I want to get to the point that that Johnny mentioned is planning for the next season because I know farmers are starting to look at uh, at planning for next season. What they, how much they're going to plant, the seedlings, everything that goes into the value chain, the fertilizer. Uh, orders, etc. Uh, so, Shadrach, perhaps you can just uh, make that point again around the uh, Tobacco Alliance, the Tobacco uh, Transformation Alliance. Uh, I just want to say too that I strongly support that you organize yourself well around that. It, it's very important that your voice be heard there. Uh, Shadrach, can you hear me? 
Yes, uh, I can hear you. Thanks. If if you can expand again on the just the latter part of what you were saying just now, because we your audio broke up very badly uh, on the uh, the importance of the South African uh, Tobacco uh, Transformation Alliance, and then also touch on the 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 impact that it has on planning uh, for tobacco farmers now. Thank you, John. Uh, I think uh, what it's important uh, for South Africans to understand uh, is the fact that uh, BTFA being a member of uh, Tobacco Transformation Alliance, as well as uh, the commercial uh, farmers and, and tobacco, and the uh, LTP, which is the processor, as well as uh, British American Tobacco South Africa. That's uh, the value chain uh, in the industry. Uh, to make even things worse, for me down here, we have got the people that work on the farm that uh, are generating uh, income from their labor. A good one for that matter, not depending on the. Uh, from uh, getting their dignity together, they have been denied that. And uh, I've been answering questions left and right uh, from my uh, fellow uh, colleague in the farming industry, saying now it's three months uh, down the line, and the season has already started to make uh, land preparations and all that, that goes uh, with uh, a new season start. How then do you plan and uh, do all those uh, logistics without knowing when the pen would be lifted in the first place? It, it, it's really unfortunate that this thing is happening. And uh, it's being done for me, on purpose by the government that preferred that it cares for its citizens. Which citizens are they caring for? Are those criminals that they were given 100% market share? That's what they are trying to say they are caring for. And uh, to say that uh, the government now have uh, approached the MIF for COVID-19 relief fund when they've given four plus billion in three months to the criminal, is that justified? Who's going to carry all that burden for something that has been done by people, well-educated ministers for that matter? Surely, I would appeal to all South Africans, just sign on with our our petition so that the government can see. Remember, the protocols were put in place before the announcement of the lockdown that uh, social distancing, no checking of hands, uh, washing, and all that are only smokers so stupid that they cannot understand the safety protocol to save their own lives. That's unfortunate. For people that have been put in the office on the passport that they will look after the citizen, is that caring for citizens when you take four billion that is supposed to be assisting the very uh, relief in COVID-19 and give that to the criminal? I really, I really don't know. It's unfortunate. And uh, to be honest, jobs are lost. Massive stock for the poorest of the poor in the rural areas where I'm from, where all these new era tobacco farmers are from. 
It means now to me the government is creating slaves in a form of people that will be curing to get grants which amount to 350 rand than someone getting a basic income for his labor. That's what I purport as a, a, a current government should be doing. But they say people need to queue for 350 rand instead of working and getting a decent income that brought that they are digging. But uh, being said, we will continue engaging the government. We are not going to turn back. We will continue. Fortunately, now it seems like most South Africans are coming to understand the importance of making the government to be accountable. There is no way to make the government be accountable than signing the petition to lift the ban now, not tomorrow. Thank you, Shadrach. Uh, really important uh, input uh, from you. I want to ask you uh, two questions, uh, short questions. The, the, the one is, have you had contact with the Department of Agriculture or the Minister of Agriculture, Land Reform and Rural Development, Minister De Deza, uh on the problems you're facing? And secondly, is what are the alternatives for, for the uh, tobacco farmers? Uh, is it is it viable to look at vegetables? Because that's, this is sometimes uh, the the issue that, that we get asked. Uh, are there alternatives then for, for the tobacco farmers? Uh, because uh, I, I absolutely share your sentiment on the loss of jobs and the loss of livelihoods. And to me, a basic income grant doesn't solve that problem at all. Uh, it, work is also around dignity, etc. And we, we've got to keep people in work. So just your thoughts on those two uh, questions. Uh, I think uh, with that one, let me just uh, put this uh, thing uh, clear for a start. For the tobacco industry, so to speak, which I started uh, in 2010, uh, we have got a, a ready market that when we sell, we started preparing land for next season. I already know what kind of income I'm going to benefit when we start selling. As I'm speaking now, I've planted 20,000 cabbages and 10,000 spinach as I'm speaking. And I don't know where I'm going to sell that because I don't have the market for that. So when you look at uh, the, the other stuff like uh, what are we going to do with the government, we'll continue to reason with the government until they do what is correct for them to do. And I want to appeal to all the ministers, not uh, only Minister Togo Dijiza, but all the government ministers in South Africa, because those are, are our government, they must bring their heads together and look where are they taking the country into. Because generally, if you can throw away that kind of money away only for one thing that you cigarette uh, people will share cigarettes, which is unfortunate, because how would one share cigarette when they cannot check hands, they cannot uh, come closer than a, a meter in between? Yeah, I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Absolutely. So, we will continue as we did before. Before lockdown, we petition the government and tell them that we really accept the lockdown because it was meant to save lives. But unfortunately, on their back of their heads, they knew that uh, they were hunting for the guinea fowl in the form of uh, the tobacco industry, which fortunately they have managed uh, to get at the expense of all those uh, livelihoods 
that they are now at stake. And I don't believe uh, any reasonable farm will go and farm without having first studied the feasibility of the product that we want to sell. They come saying 20,000 cabbages and 10,000 spinach. I don't know where I'm going to sell them. I've got it because I, I tried to uh, diversify. But uh, not everyone has that kind of uh, courage to venture into unknown uh, territory like I've done. Okay, thank you, Shadrach. You, you make really very good points. You've got to produce the market and you've got to have a strong indication of what your price expectations can be and that there will be a market for your product. Uh, and that point is, is very well made and I also support strongly that you keep engaging uh, with government. Your arguments are very sound. Uh, I want to get back to the illicit trade, um, uh, Sinin, and uh, I read the book the President's Keepers by Jack Poe. You might also have read it. And uh, in it, it, it delves into the illicit trade in, in, in tobacco products or cigarettes quite extensively. It was very much part of the state capture scenario for my say so. And uh, it was quite scary to read that, that, that there is actually no control over this uh, illicit trade. And now it's booming. We, what, what do you think the outcome is going to be? How can we afford this type of of illegal trade and then bring in such drastic measures. It just makes no sense to me. Uh, your thoughts on that? It's so, been an appetite for those kind of books. I mean, after the President's Keeper, we saw a book by Don Van Rockenberg, Dirty Tobacco, no, Tobacco Wars, that's what it was called. And then there was a follow up book now recently by Atelita Snake, it's called um, Dirty Tobacco. And there seems to be, you know, be a number of books highlighting the illicit trade problem. There was, of course, the Nugent Commission, uh, which looked into the affairs at SARS. And then, obviously, I mean, there's been a lot of campaigns from within the industry and, you know, discussions from uh, industry. I mean, the, the, the association that uh, Johnny and them were part of previously, TISA, had, uh, you know, campaigned quite uh, extensively on this issue. And of late, we, we've also raised you know, a lot of concerns from our side with, with government through its uh, various uh, holdings and uh, law enforcement agencies. But uh, to be frank with you, I, I, I don't see, it doesn't seem to be a, a, either a will or capacity, one of the two. You know, it's, it's difficult to say. I, I, don't, I think government has challenges because, I mean, every now and then we, we hear that something is being done and this is being implemented only for that thing to be withdrawn. And you don't know what the reasons are for its withdrawal. I mean, there was the track and trace, which was much publicized for a year and a half. So I was going on about how they were going to implement this track and trace solution, which was in essence going to, you know, monitor um, the sale of, of the manufactured sale of cigarettes and whether HRs have been paid on them. And then for recently, I think just before we went into lockdown, they announced that they had uh, suspended that process. And uh, one, one doesn't know, I mean, uh, we, we've had issues, I mean, just before lockdown again, one of our members had an uh, incident where one of their brands was counterfeited from a factory as far afield as Cambodia. And they had smuggled them into South Africa under the guise of furniture. And I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think that those guys, it was their first attempt at bringing the cigarettes in. And you, you, you may find that uh, that's happening. And I mean, I don't know if Johnny and them have similar experiences in as far as counterfeiting of their brands, but we also see um, something which wasn't really an issue previously, uh, and I'm not certain as to why it's, it's become rampant, but uh, a lot of cigarettes coming from Zimbabwe and Zambia and, uh, and Lesotho, uh, much more than we used to have before. And again, you know, we've, we've raised these issues to government. You can do this until you're black and blue. And and uh, I feel uh, Shadrach's pain, but I, I don't think, I don't know what they're going to do. I mean, industry has offered assistance for years, even before I became involved in industry. I mean, I I'd read um, extensively about what industry was trying to do to combat that issue. But I mean, we offer assistance. I mean, there's all sorts of we know it's a South African thing to become a, a South African sort of. Um, Habit to form commissions of inquiry and. 
the bow is there blue, it, it looks like things are going to be that. And then we, 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 we shift from those, those conditions of inquiry or symposiums or whatever, where everyone has given these beautiful speeches and then you go back to square one. So, I mean, uh, as Johnny stated earlier on, this is government's attitude to industry now. It, it's pretty much the same even outside of lockdown, in that it, for them to listen is it, it, a very, very difficult sort of task. And I don't know what we're going to do as an industry. You know, to get government to listen to our concerns. I mean, I I know I've discussed this with Johnny, and I, I will tell you that I mean, we tried. I mean, I tried my best to try and even secure one discussion. I mean, even during the the um, the legal proceedings, I thought it would make it easier to sort of get around the table with government and and discuss. But you know, we were told that um, we, we were promised meetings, and then those meetings were sort of, you know. Um, disregarded without any courtesy to us. I mean, as industry openers, and there seems to be a lack of care, really. So I, I can't, I can't say what can be done because I mean, we we unfortunately do rely on the state for enforcement, and without them, there's nothing we can do. It's it's quite expensive, um, and I mean, we we've um, sort of started initiatives of decriminalisation, but it's 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 expensive. It's it's, it's something that one cannot do. The help of the state. John, can I just jump in there? Yes, Johnny, uh, please come in. On, on, on this point that, that, that Sinan is making, look, um, in terms of uh, engagement with government, I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's a moot point now to, to try and argue with that and say, you know, at this stage, um, uh, I don't know, they'll give us access in any. I mean, they were very clear around Easter period where they said, uh, government is ready to fight all the challenges around the regulations, uh, but they are prepared to go for mediation except for the tobacco issue. They say on the tobacco issue, we are not prepared to go for mediation. So, I mean, uh, that was very, you know, they fired the first shots in this regard to say that they are not prepared to hear us out. But having said that, I, I think uh, uh, we as industry also owe it ourselves to be honest with our, ourselves. You know, uh, uh, there are some some clear things that uh, we need to be doing, and uh, working with. I mean, uh, not all is bad necessarily in government. I mean, we've been working quite well with SARS. It's just that in this regard, their role is not to drive policies, just to implement. You know, and and we don't have the wherewithal to to deal with some of these concerns. But we also need to take some of the issues that are, are, are happening currently in the market very seriously. If we look at the UCT study, uh, uh, and we can't nitpick, you know, the UCT study, uh, they've had two rounds of those, right? And and I think uh, we also owe it to look at our own supply chains and look at our own uh, members in terms of what they are doing wrong that further compromises us. You know, we're not locking ourselves in glory. And 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 Sinan here in the second report that just came from Connie van Welbeck, uh, uh, here where suddenly product from some of your members is still turning into the market. I don't know what you guys are doing about this. How are you making sure that your your members actually have robust control mechanisms in place in terms of making sure that uh, we don't see product filtering into the market? You can clearly see. Uh, 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 I mean, we put mechanisms in place to make sure that. There is no product of ours that comes through. Yes, counterfeit is a problem. We've had uh, some of our most popular brands being counterfeited even before uh, lockdown. And these are the things that ahead of time, we had already made sure that within our own uh, uh, systems, we are let SARS on this one. And they can exactly know what a counterfeit brand looks like. And you know, there's a robust process where you can do a like for like comparison that you know, this is how you can tell that a brand is counterfeit. And they've seized a couple of uh, uh, containers that have come from Asia uh, with uh, our counterfeited brands. And fortunately, because these are things that we put a lot of emphasis on. Because remember, we, we trade in our name. Our name is all that we have, right? So we have a responsibility as well of making sure that whatever is done uh, to our products in our name, uh, we actually can, you know, be able to account for that. And this is very important as well that uh, for the for the feature members, they need to actually take accountability for that. That How is it possible that some of their brands now are still so very much uh, available in the market? How, four months into the lockdown, 
And that doesn't help us, you know, with our case fighting out there. That is why even government is just prepared to let us do, to say, well, you guys are, are bringing this unto yourselves, you know. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Johnny. Yes, I think there's, there's a lot of points of debate that we that we can expand on in this in this uh, uh, process. Uh, I, th I, I th we had a meeting with ministers William Kesey on Friday, NEDLAC meeting, uh, more on the on the alcohol uh, issue, and he has opened the door for for negotiations with the alcohol uh, industry. So we we had two meetings over the weekend. We had a meeting this morning. And we're starting to, 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 I think, to open the door ajar, but we've got to get negotiation with government going. And, uh, we must bring them to the table and we, we, we must put all the issues on the table to see that we can get the, both the alcohol and the tobacco industries going again. Because the loss of jobs, the damage to the economy, the loss to the fiscus, the loss to livelihoods is just, is just too awful to contemplate. And no income grant is going to uh, is going to uh, substitute for that loss that we that we suffer, uh, and and how we deal with the illicit trade, especially in the cigarette issue, is is, is a major concern. So I want to start wrapping up this uh, discussion, uh, and I'm going to give you all a chance to to re respond. Uh, Johnny, I'll start with you. I see you want to respond. Yeah, no, no, no. I was just asking a question to what you are saying. That I'm quite surprised, you know, that tobacco says boo and government jumps, you know, uh, and, and, and since you are, you've been privy to these discussions and not us, I mean, why is the attitude so us very hard against tobacco so hard, you know? I, I think that's a very good question. And, and, uh, one must also understand that within, within governments, and I must be very honest if I say that, and it's, it's in the public now if I say that, but, I don't think there's a lot of consensus even within government, within cabinet, on dealing with this matter. Uh, we must we must understand that that the minister of Copter uh, is the minister who's responsible for the Disaster Management Act, and she or drives or she uh, gets her authority basically from that act. Uh, mm -hmm. it supersedes. It's been in the media, even from a constitutional point of view, it's been challenged uh, or argued. That, that the powers are too, too supreme or too, too, too strong, even over the president in terms of the powers that she has with the Disaster Management Act. So there, there's quite a lot of talk about that, uh, uh, what the interaction is within government. We know that, that within the economic cluster, at least, they are sensitive to the issue of job losses, to the loss, to the fiscus, uh, et cetera. But we, we, but we need to keep pushing the arguments and we need to try and have a structured engagement with government. Uh, unfortunately, we, well, we're trying this now with the alcohol. We must, we must do the same with the tobacco. Uh, we are working behind the scenes to drive it. Uh, you are aware of some of our actions in this regard. But I think in the end, that's the only way we're going to solve this problem. But we will also use these platforms to engage with the arguments, uh, to, to get the message out to government. Uh, that we want to talk, that we want to resolve these issues. It's in the best interest of the country to do that. Sure, yep. we must look at, but government also have to come to the party in the process. We've got to have some sort of social compact around uh, around how we deal with um, say, um, the tobacco industry and the alcohol industry, because the up and down value chain effects are enormous mm -hmm. uh, in both industries. Okay. Uh, I'm also going to make some closing comments, uh, uh, firstly from Sinem, and then I'm going to give Shadrach the last word. No, look, I, I, I think we, one has to find a way to, you know, engage with, with the government and, and push this, this matter forward. Um, I, I do not know how it is going to, to um, happen. They don't seem to be keen to come to, come to the table on this as well as the issues we anticipate that the legal challenge is to be before the court for some months still. So I don't, I don't know how we're going to actually find a point to the table we're going to you know, sit around the table with government and deal with these issues. But as things um, currently stand, we are pushing forward with the court challenges. And uh, again, as far as industry is concerned, we also hope that, you know, bouncing ideas off each other and having a discussion and having one unified voice. I think that's very helpful towards us. I think it's very important to have that unified voice, as you indicated. I see the collaboration both in the tobacco industry and in uh, 
the alcohol industry is improving. Uh, people are getting onto the same page. So it's very important that we keep up our efforts uh, in this regard. And thanks again also to you, Sinem, for your participation and the, and the, and the great work that you're doing. Uh, you know, I come from farming stuff, grew up on a farm, and so my heart also, also lies with the farmers in the process. And I want to give Shadrach a, a last word. Shadrach, um, some more from your side? Mm, no, no. Okay, there is. Come to its senses uh, so that uh, they can do good uh, for the citizens. Yes. And uh, I would uh, urge, uh, more especially the minister and Copter, to say it's better too late than never. And uh, they need to swallow their pride. We are not going to say you made a mistake. They would come here and say, South Africans, we made a great mistake in sending the state of Karet. That was an unfortunate, unfortunate area. We apologize. So, if by tomorrow they will say they've lifted the pen, they will go down as the honorable minister. Thank you so much. I want to say a great word of appreciation to, uh, to Shadrach, um, representing uh, SATA and the um, Black Tobacco Farmers Association, uh, to uh, Sinem and uh for the FITA and the work that you're doing, and then uh, Johnny also to you, Johnny Malota from Watsa, uh, it's a standout South African company uh, for the work that you've been doing. And thank you very much for participating in this uh, very important session. And we are behind you as we try and get the ban lifted so that we uh, can get the value chain working so that we can get livelihoods on the go again and we can all act responsibly in addressing this pandemic. Thank you very much to you. We really do appreciate it.